Hi, I'm Katie and this is episode 58 of Ornamentations and for today I have so much to share with you. I have some sampler progress to close out the end of Sampler September. I have some plans. I have some news. I have some starts. Yes, I did start Thomas the very dapper turkey that we talked about in the last episode and I will be sharing that with you. Although, spoiler alert, my start is kind of tiny and pathetic. I was doing some other things. And then we'll also towards the end be looking at the beginning stages of the design process for my next casket. Now that's going to be a really start stop journey. I don't have a lot of time to devote to that right now, but we will follow this next casket start to finish on my floss tube on the Brita Mark casket. I was already I think probably over halfway by the time I started my floss tube. So we saw a partial journey on that casket. This time we'll go start to finish. Although it's gonna be an extended journey because I have a lot that I'm stitching and doing right now. But before we get there, oh, and I have the giveaway winners from the last episode and we'll announce those at the very end of today's episode. So stay tuned to see if you won. But let's start with the end of Sampler September. It's now October and it finally actually feels like October. It's a beautiful overcast, gray, cool day here in Northern California. I've got a nice warm sweater on, which I love because I'm all about cool weather. I do not like heat, but last week we had this crazy heat wave. Northern California is really temperate, so this doesn't happen all that often and almost never in October five straight days of temperatures over 90. It killed my AC. So I was just in my house sweating and miserable. It was awful. So I'm really, really happy to see some sweater weather here. I'm sure you really wanted to know that. Let's talk samplers. Anyways, so before it was October, I spent the last week of September focusing on Oh Sweet Humility by Cross Stitch Antiques, Eliza Townsend's work because I knew I was going to have to set this aside at the start of October to focus on other projects. So this is where I ended up. I'm finding it very hard to put this aside, but I do have other things I need to get to. I added some more flowers to the border and I could kick myself because I had such a goof on this one. I stitched the stem first, then I put in the little green bit leading to the flower, convinced myself that it was off center, counted both ways, and then thought my mistake was here in the stem. So I frogged it, I restitched it, put in the flower and then realized that my stem had been correct all along. It was how I placed the flower that was off. So I took out correct stitching and replaced it with a mistake, which seems very, very dumb, but I'm not stitching it a third time. So instead I just marked the chart at the opposite side to make sure I make the same mistake on the border there so that everything lines up correctly and I think that'll be just fine. You know, it's a big piece. No one's going to notice that one tiny mistake. Probably not going to be the only mistake. No, it's definitely not the only mistake because as we mentioned last time, my house is three rows off. So I'm just really leaning into the quirky on this sampler and I am fine with it. I think people are going to be so distracted by those glorious colors that nobody's going to be counting my rows or well I hope not anyways so then I also made a change to the manor house I replaced what I think on the original is a columned covered porch with an extra row of windows between the two doors on the bottom level of the manor house because I just think that reads more clearly from a distance it says Fabulous manor house to me. I like the look, so that's what I did. I think it's, as a design thing, consistent with the original, even if it's not a reproduction, it looks great, so I'm really happy with that. And then I did take the grass down a little further. I finished the pond and then added some more animals, including that quirky red cow. Looks fabulous. I am just loving this piece and loving the colors that gorgeous, vibrant red. It just sings. The pinks and the greens are just beautiful. So 
I'm thinking maybe instead of setting this aside entirely, I might try and find one Saturday a month where I just really put in one good day on this and then I'll have a little more forward progress when I can come back to Eliza's Townsend's work and pick it up again in earnest. That won't be for a while. So we'll see what happens with that. And then I also wanted to talk about an upcoming start. This will be on Legacy Linen 5363, Cecilia Marsman one of my favorite linens of all time. I just love it. And you've heard me discuss this before. That's Fox and Rabbit's Elizabeth Campbell 1838. And this is just the computer generated image. I will link to their last floss tube. If you haven't already seen it, you probably have. I mean, if you watch me, I'm sure you watch Karen and Bren, but they showed the finished and framed model in their most recent floss tube. And I'll link that in the description. You have to see it. It's gorgeous. I saw this in progress at summer school and it was what just made me absolutely obsessed with this piece. So I have been thinking a lot about Elizabeth Campbell, about colors, but most of all, I've been thinking about the name and the alphabet because as we've discussed before on my channel, I hate stitching letters. I mean, I just loathe it. I don't carry my threads, so I start and stop each letter individually and it just annoys me to no end. I'm not a fan and I have had to stitch a lot of letters for AKG, AKGIT 1833, so I'm like at my letter quotient for the entire year already. So I was thinking about ways I might tweak this chart a little bit. Maybe I could just eliminate that, move the border down, but then that would really throw off the proportions of the chart. And then I had a brainwave. And I don't really know what the purpose of this brainwave is. It's not actually sure when I'm gonna get to start this. I hope very soon because I really just do love it and I can't wait to pick all the colors. I will do my own um, silk conversion for this and share it with you. It'll be so vain because 5363. And that is that this could become a heritage sampler for my father's side. So as we discussed when I was stitching this happy morning, which will be a kit in 2024, I made some changes on it to honor my mother's side of the family, specifically my grandmother, my great aunt, and the family farm where they grew up. And when I was stitching this and discussing that with my mom, we'd be sitting and stitching together and talking about like, how was I going to do Tony the Pony and all the little changes I was making my father. <laughs> but it ended at one point and said, well, where am I on this? And my mother looked at him and said, um, I'm sorry, was this your family farm? And I just kind of found out it went away. I was like, really, Dad? I mean, he never seems to pay much attention, especially to like our cross stitching. But that washed in my brain and gave me the idea to make Elizabeth Campbell a heritage sampler for my father's side. He's Scottish. So most of my family originally came from the British Isles, but my mother's side has been in America for quite a long time. My dad, not so much. He was born in England and came to America as a child. His father was very very Scottish and that's where this comes from. I have my grandfather's coloring. My mom was also a redhead, although she was much more auburn. This like really vibrant orange, all from grandpa. Anyways, so a Scottish sampler is perfect to honor my dad's side and what would be perfect and consistent with Scottish samplers would be to take out the alphabet and name and replace that with a series of crowned initials. I've done just a little doodling on graph paper and I think I should just about be able to squeak that in. So my father, my grandfather, my grandmother, or perhaps myself will all actually chart that out and see what looks good in that space. So I'll be doing Elizabeth Campbell slightly altered to honor my father's side of the family since I did one to honor my mother's side. And that actually has me even more excited to do Elizabeth Campbell. So I'm gonna have to carve out some time to make a start on this one soon. 
And then, oh, big sampler what? Modern Folk Embroidery, aka GIT 1833. We've been following my progress on this for quite a while and we'll be following it for ooh, lots more time. I hope you're not sick of it yet because I'm approaching halfway, but I'm not there yet. I'm almost done with page nine. So when last I saw you, I had to finish this medallion, the one just before the Y. And then I added the next large Erwine, all those small medallions around it, the letters at the bottom, and then now I'm in progress on that little one with the stars. I really love that one. It's so lacy and beautiful. So I finished the medallion there and then I placed just the edge of the one next to it, then worked up so that I could start this lacy one and then fill in that negative space between the two trees of life. That just was kind of what made sense to my brain. Normally when I'm doing the medallions, I'll start at the edge, I'll work my way in to the center fill in the center motif and then work outwards. I find that that's just a more efficient way of working these and it, you don't work yourself into a corner basically, or I seem to not work myself <laughs> into a corner. So that's usually how I do it. But in this case, I wanted to get up to that beautiful little medallion with the open stars. So that was how I worked. You could also count off the trees of life, but given how exact the placement on everything, how, how exact the placement is on everything here, I tend to count off the most narrow spaces so that there's the least room for error. That's been working pretty well for me so far. Everything seems to be in the correct position. So I'm pushing forward with this. I am getting a little bogged down in the medallions, but I'm just plowing ahead and hoping to get a second wind once I reach that halfway point and then I get to start a different type of totally symmetrical medallion in the next row. So AAGIT looking absolutely fabulous and then i will also be putting my own initials in so i'm almost to akgit 1833 and then i'll be putting my own initials in but leaving off the date one because i don't know when i'll finish this it definitely won't be 2023 i hope it will be 2024 and also because doing the initials and the date does really crowd that there's a little more negative space around most of the letters so i think doing just my initials is a little more visually consistent you know i'm not akgit and this is not 1833 so yeah i'm putting my own initials in on this because I am the one who has put in all these hours and I'm gonna own that. So that is the fabulous, fabulous, fabulous AKGIT 1833. Again, this is on 5363 Sicilian Mars of Ham. And then I did want to answer one more question I've been getting a lot recently, which is how do I get my linen so smooth on my whips? I don't spend hours pressing before my floss tube. I do just a quick and dirty job, but yes, as you've noticed, my linen does tend to look really smooth and there is a secret to that. Although this comes with a monster disclaimer. Please listen to what I'm about to tell you because I do not want to be responsible for a disaster, which could happen. This only works with color stable materials. If you are in doubt about that, test them first. So if you're using over dyed cotton floss, not color stable. If you're using over dyed linen, test first. Some of them are and some of them aren't. I don't know exactly which ones. Always test first if you are in doubt. But the way that you do this, assuming that your materials are color stable, that you've tested them, that you know you're okay to proceed. Take your linen and then spritz, 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 lightly and evenly 
with a little mister bottle of cold water, always cold, cool, room temperature, never warm or hot because that can set any dye that does run in, you know, sometimes they can run unexpectedly. If the water's cold, you're not up a creek, you can fix that. If the water is hot or warm, you might have just permanently damaged your work. So cool, cold water. This is just a travel mister bottle in CVS. It's the same thing I used for blocking. That's covered in Simple Harmony tutorial number eight, which also covers what to do if you try this and your color runs. So mist lightly and then take your iron, put it on the linen setting, but dry, no steam. So the combination of the lightly misted cold water on your linen and the dry heat of the iron produces this really smooth, almost glassy, glossy finish on your linen with no effort and it can get out even the most stubborn creases. It's a really great trick that again, only works with color stable materials. So just be careful. And if you're in doubt about whether or not your materials are color stable, test them first on a little bit of scrap of fabric. So that's why AKGOT and my other whips always look so neat or usually look so neat. I mean, I think I usually press everything reasonably well before floss tube. Put your best foot forward, right? So then fall stitching, fall stitching. I love fall. Falls, you know, the transitional seasons are always my favorite in terms of weather. I love sweaters and jackets and nice cool temperatures and breezes. So fall stitching, I'm into it. I am going to show you Thomas a little bit. That was my fall start, but because Thomas is a kid and the release on that is almost a year away, and you guys did vote overwhelmingly that you would like to see it, but it strikes me that that is still kind of a tease. So I am going to have some fall stitching silk conversions to share with you for the next episode. So you can do a little fall a la Katie right now if you would like to. So when I was stitching on the fall small tiny jewel tiny treasures kit my mom was watching me and got all into the idea of stitching a fall piece herself so she ditched Clara Hansen and went ahead and started Plum Street Samplers Hello Fall part of her haul from the Attic Summer School which she showed you on that episode. I did a silk conversion for her she's stitching on Filbert it looks absolutely fabulous for so for the next episode i will be sharing that with you i don't know if she'll be on but i'll definitely bring her piece on if she can't come herself they're traveling so um as you might have heard my parents celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary in late august so they are taking a trip together this week and they'll be traveling for a few weeks to celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary. So anyways, if she's not here for my next episode, then I will just filter stitching and share the conversion with you. So Plum Street Samplers, Hello Fall. It looks absolutely beautiful. I'm really digging it. And then I'm also hoping to have a new small start myself. So I bought Stacy Nash, this is the Good Witch Pin Keep. I'd like to stitch this, I think maybe on 45 count foxtail millet. And that's a really quick, simple conversion, not too many threads. So if you've been thinking about trying silk, this might be a great choice for you. And then I should have a complete conversion for you for the next episode as well as a start of my own. So for next time, I'll have two fall conversions to share with you since Thomas will not be available for the better part of the year. I feel a little guilty on that, but let's talk about Thomas because I did start him. And in the last episode, I asked you if you wanted to see my kit stitching in real time now that I'm having to work so far ahead with my current kit stitch being Thomas from Not Forgotten Farm. And the answer overwhelmingly was yes, people did want to see it. 
but there were a few people who said that they would rather not. Okay, so I paused the video to sneeze, or so I thought, and apparently I did not resume it. <laughs> Because a few hours later, when I went to sit down and edit this episode together, I found that this entire segment was missing. So it's now late afternoon. My AC has been repaired. Hooray. And I'm coming back to you to talk about Thomas. So this might be a little disjointed of an episode, but let's look at my stitching on thomas as a reminder this is going to be a kit that's coming next year and some of you did not want to see the stitching until closer to the time so if that's the case then go and skip ahead just a little bit because we are going to look at my weenie little start on thomas by not forgotten farm he is such a charming and dapper turkey. I love him, but I haven't done a lot, or at least it doesn't look like a lot. So I started him on a big piece of cloister cream and then placed him very, very oddly. I'm terrible at starting. I mean, every time I got something with big margins, I totally waste some by placing it very close to the edge. Not relevant. Anyways, so I've only got three colors picked. I started with the gray. That was actually quite an interesting choice. I had originally thought that something a little darker was called for, but I started three different grays and they all just looked harsh on the cloister cream. So I ended up going much lighter than I had originally planned. And I started with this single stitch outline on that side thinking I don't know is that going to be too light see if I hold that back you can see just how that one stitch outline doesn't really pop off the fabric so I moved up to the top and just did a little bit of a block saw that yeah you can see it on the cloister cream and proceed it because with a conversion you should start with either what you know and work outwards or the most important color and work outwards and the body of Thomas is kind of what everything flows from. The other color choices all need to work through that. So I needed to get the gray in first. Um, from there, I worked down to his legs. I did the mound and Thomas has 17 called for colors, which in DMC is fine. In silk, that would make for a very expensive kit. So I am not gonna do a one for one conversion. I am compressing this as I often do. And part of that is keeping an eye on expense and some of that is just color preferences because I think using fewer shades can actually kind of give you more cohesion in your finish. So it's for a variety of reasons. So I've chosen a lighter green for the mound under Thomas and the great thing about that is that means it'll also work for the stems which i would like to all be in the same color so that's three colors that are now just one spool of silk likewise with his feet and beak that's a very orange yellow on the called for that's less my taste in colors i like these more rich gold colors so I decided if I switched the feet and beak to that, that could then also pull double duty on say part of the feathers. So again, that's another place where I can suit my own taste and then also be a little more economical with thread to try and make sure that Thomas the Turkey isn't a stupidly expensive <laughs> kit for you all. But I think it's going to be great. You have to use your imagination a great deal at this point because I really don't have much in yet. These are the colors that I'm thinking about. Of course, this is not a complete conversion at all, but you can see what a rich fall palette that's going to be. And I am actually swimming against my own color preferences just a little bit here because that olive green is not usually what I go for. I like my greens a little more towards middle value, lots of yellow, no brown. So olives aren't usually my thing, but I think that just goes so well with those rich autumn colors. 
And on oranges, because you've got some oh, just really great standout shades on Thomas, it, I normally go for something with a lot of yellow in it, like this. Less so the bittersweets with more red content. However, there's this beautiful gold blend, and I think you can put the oranges that I like a little more with the bittersweets that the pattern calls for and produce this really just oh, rich, beautiful result. So I think Thomas is going to be absolutely stunning. When I get a little further along and start working on those feathers, which are just going to make him pop. But as I said, I really want to establish the color on the body and then I'll start to add in more color and hopefully make this a little more interesting. I also think this is going to look just fabulous on the cloister cream. Those rich autumn colors are just going to shine. So I don't have too much to show you for this episode, but I'm hoping to put in some good time on him. That's so awesome. The placement on this lemon is just ridiculous. I'm going to have to cut that down just because it annoys me looking at it. But I hope to put in some good time on Thomas before the next episode and hopefully have some progress to show you. Get some of these beautiful colors in there, maybe add a few more, and we'll see how he progresses. I'm really looking forward to stitching him and just given the comments, a lot of you are really looking forward to silk kit on him as well. And now I really don't know where I left off in my original segment on Thomas, so this is gonna be an awkward transition. So speaking of kits that are planned, many of you expressed in the comments for the last video that in addition to seeing kit stitching in real time, you'd also like to know what's being planned so that you know essentially what to wait for. Now, I will not be revealing the full 2024 kit schedule because I'm still working on that, but I will tell you what is definitely coming for the next year. If you'd rather be surprised, skip ahead a few minutes because we will talk about what's on deck and what's definitely going to be a kit in the next year. So the first kit for 2024 will be this Happy Morning by Plum Street Samplers. And then for spring, there will be the first of the Tiny Treasures and those are going to be surprise reveals. There will be one for spring and one for fall. They're already stitched. They look fabulous. I'm so pleased with how they came out. And so those are going to be just little surprises that are revealed at the time. But the larger kit that'll be offered alongside it in late spring or early summer will be what I previewed in the last episode and that's Plum Street Sampler's Chocolate Hearts. I love this chart because it reminds me of one of my other favorite things that I've stitched and of a favorite poem. But we'll talk more about that one in just a second. And so then there will be a Christmas in July kit, which I may change this around to the big holiday release, just kind of depending on what comes out. I can't wait to see what holiday patterns will be coming out for this year, but what will definitely be a holiday kit, whether it's a holiday release or Christmas in July, will be Stacy Nash. It's a Wonderful Life drum. I loved this one. It was a club kit and I couldn't wait to buy it once it was in full release. I'm gonna stitch that on Himalayan Fog. I've already picked the colors. It's gonna look fantastic. So I'll be stitching that this winter. Sorry, big tease. And then the ball kit, as we've already discussed, will be Thomas by Not Forgotten Farms. That's not the full kit schedule, but that's what's definitely on deck for 2024. So let's talk about chocolate hearts for a second because I showed you my little start in the last episode. I do have a little more to share with you, but I wanted to talk about some of what drew me to this chart specifically. So that rose really reminds me of the roses that I did for the interior lid of my green casket, which I showed you in episode 54. And this is a great example of how 
different things can lead different minds to similar places in art because this charts from 2015 it's not recent so this actually predates my own stitching on the rose panel for my green casket but i hadn't seen this at that point what i was looking at was this extraordinary piece um, from the 17th century stitched by Helena Wintour and it's the Boddenham Chalice Veil. Unfortunately, the metal threads have heavily tarnished over time, but all of that grayish dark stuff would have originally been sparkling silver as it was on my own piece and featured these fabulous, glorious roses. So if you saw the interior of the lid of my green casket, you can see just how clearly I was inspired by this piece, but it also, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat this morning, echoes the shape and colors of this. This whole chart has a more 17th century feel to it, so of course I absolutely adore it. But as I said, it also reminds me of one of my favorite poems, and that would be Sir Thomas Wyatt, who so list to hunt, I know where it is in hind. But as for me, alas, I may no more. The vain travail hath wearied me so sore. I am of those that furthest come behind. Yet may I, yet may I by no means my wearied mind draw from the deer, as she fleeth afore, Fainting I follow. I leave off, therefore, since in a net I seek to hold the wind. Who lists her hunt, I put him out of doubt, that he, as well as I, may spend his time in vain. For graven with diamonds and letters plain, there is written her fair neck round about. Touch me not, for Caesar's I am, and wild for to hold, though I seem tame. Which I think is the whole thing. Probably not word perfect, but close enough. Sir Thomas Wyatt, Who So List Hunt, it's always been one of my favorite poems. And, oh yeah, also from the English Renaissance area. I'm really predictable in terms of what my inspirations are. So I was very drawn to Chocolate Hearts. And let's take a look at what I've done on it since I saw you last. Not actually very much because I really just established the conversion. So this is where I am and I have made, essentially I've just tweaked the balance of colors. So the linen is warmer and then I inverted the greens to follow my own color preferences. So. The dominant green on Chocolate Hearts is a blue green, and then she's got a yellow green for the accent shade. I prefer yellow green, so I made that my dominant green, and then I switched to a darker blue toned green with some gray in it as my complementary green shade. Sorry about the glare, it's overcast, but that's not really diminishing the amount of light that comes in. And then I just warmed up the colors with the exception of this beautiful red. That was a more orange toned red in the original, but to compensate for what I did to the green, I turned that into a very clear toned red with some slightly blue undertones to offset the yellow that's in the green and I think that's turned out really well. So I am now going to put this aside because at this point I have not only all the colors in, but I've stitched enough of them to be sure that they're working. They're working with the linen, they're working together. And so I will be stitching the rest of this closer to the time. So we'll look at Chocolate Hearts again in 2024 when I pick this one back up again that I did want to share with you my progress as well as a little bit about why I picked that chart. And then, oh, just brief news item. There are still spots available in Queen Anne's Pen Pillow, which is behind me now that you can really see it <laughs> up there on the bookcase. And I am just so excited about the class we are going to have at 
wonderful class. However, I've talked to you to death about that already. So full spiel was two episodes ago. I'll link all of the information in the description. If you're interested, please email me if you have questions and I hope you'll think about joining the class. It's going to be a great one. And then another more new news item, which you may have already seen or heard because it was in the Addicts newsletter and Karen and Bren of Fox and Rabbit also talked about this on their most recent Floss Tube. But I am going to be returning to summer school as an instructor next year. And then Karen and Bren of Fox and Rabbit are also joining the faculty. It's gonna be a great time. I'm really excited. I know they're really excited. I hope that you're excited to join us. It's going to be great, although <laughs> fair warning. I do not have another amazing Civil War artifact up my sleeve. I shot my shot. I'm never going to live up to that performance and my mother is going to come again too when I confirmed joining the faculty. I asked my mom if she would like to come again as well and she was really excited. She said yes, but the first thing she said after that was, so how are you going to top this year's performance? I'm just like, you know what? No, I'm not. I have already peaked. Sorry. But I hope to put together something fun and exciting um, for this year. So I've already got an idea. I'm working on it and I am really excited for summer school. I know Karen and Bren are as well. So that's going to be fabulous. It's a ways out, but I'm already excited about it. But let's get to casket design. And that's how we'll close out this episode. I do have the giveaway winners at the very end, but I want to talk to you a little bit about what I've been doing on my upcoming casket. I have already prepared the box itself and we have looked at that before, but just to recap in case you're new to my channel or if you don't remember this, the box itself, this is a casket from Thistle Threads. It's called the Short Flat. It has the simplest interior of any of the Thistle Threads caskets. It's also got the shortest sides and the smallest design space. So that's the name. And this was a common type that was found in 17th century. Caskets came in a very wide variety of just kind of variations on the idea of the embroidered box. So this is the short flat casket and it's already been prepped and ready for my not yet designed, let alone started embroidery to be applied to the box. So caskets come just as raw wood from thistle threads and then you have to do all the rest of the work yourself. So for the exterior that means papering it to protect your embroidery from the raw wood, which is very corrosive to textiles. And then I've also prepped the interior, which we've looked at before, but this is a beautiful, beautiful silk fabric that I imported from France along with the coordinating velvet. And then I just lightly over embellished and highlighted the pattern of the flowers with spangles, with beads, and with natural pearls. Gorgeous, 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 gorgeous. I really could have done more with that now that I look at it, but you know, that's kind of just letting the fabric shine. It's unusually simple and restrained for me, <laughs> but I think the exterior is going to make up for it. And then the interior bottom is really just the gorgeous coordinating silk velvet. So that's the interior of this casket and it's ready for my embroidery to go on when it gets to that place. This is very much a long-term pro project because I don't know when I'm going to start stitching. I'm only at the very beginning. Of the design process but that's what we're going to talk about to close out this episode which is where do I start so where I start is with the concept and I already had the idea for what this casket would look like before I sat down to start 
essentially collating my inspiration. So the short flat casket type in the 17th century often had a very standard type of design. They approached those short sides frequently in the same ways and those would be with flowers flanking something called a Nelham cartouche and those were named after John Nelham the draftsmen who drew the fabric for many of these. So schoolgirls weren't coming up with their own designs or putting their own designs on their ground fabric. They were buying fabric that already had the design on it and those were done by a select number of craftspeople. And all of this history is covered in Cabinet of Curiosities part one. So if this sounds interesting to you, I'll put a link in the description take the class. It's absolutely amazing. So as part of the materials for that, Trisha provided motif libraries as well as complete panels, some of which were for a short flat casket. And I'm just going to flash this really quickly to show you what a Nelham cartouche looks like in practice. So you've got this cartouche, you put something in the middle here, and then you've got flowers flanking it on either side, which is a really common way of dealing with that. Trisha has done a fully kitted short flat casket. It's, uh, I think it's called the Harmony with Nature. I'll check that and put that information in the description. She used a lot of stump work and she did fully dimensional stump work flowers flanking her cartouches on the sides. I looked at that and thought, you know, that's what I want to do with my own, but in a slightly different way. So her inspiration was taken very much from the schoolgirl ones. I want to mix in some professional embroidery, which is kind of the other side of the coin, a 17th century English embroidery, and you see some really interesting things. So combining those two inspirations has been a theme in my casket embroidery so far and will be one going forward. So once I came up with my central idea, now I have to flush that out, get ready to draw. And that's what I've been doing so far. And so what that means is taking inspiration from all kinds of places. And this varies for everybody. What is your inspiration and how literal is it? Many people prefer to look just at the 17th century original caskets. I like to take inspiration from all kinds of things, all eras, all different types of arts and mash them together into something that is unique to me. And that's just one approach. You can definitely do something very literal, 17th century, if that's more to your taste. But this is my channel, so we're gonna talk about my process, which is taking a whole bunch of things and mashing them together. So in trying to kind of squish that into a coherent idea, I take all of my inspiration and I try to mentally organize that and that can take different forms. For a lot of my big pro projects I actually use digital inspiration boards. For this specific one I had so many different things rattling around in my mind that I actually wanted to put it down on paper. I don't normally kill this many trees for <laughs> designing a big project but for this one given everything that I'm juggling I started a sketchbook. And the first thing in my sketchbook are my inspirations and then they've been organized through visual names. So I've started the book with what I would say the image, the hero image, the thing around which everything else revolves. And this is a 17th century embroidered glove gauntlet. It features silk work, it features gold work. This was a professional piece, this was not made by a schoolgirl, and it has so many exceptional details. You have this detailed flat silk work, and then you have texture with the French knots, with the threads. You have it framed by this elaborate gold work. They've mixed gold threads and silk threads. It's just 
it's a masterpiece. This image has been living in my head for a long time. And this, if I had to pick one inspiration that would define this entire casket, this is it. So this one at the very front, because this is what I always want to look at first, because my idea is that this is going to be the sides of my casket. I'm going to do birds and silk with some texture trees, mounds around them. They're going to be in gold cartouches worked with fabulous gold threads with lots of textures. And then they're going to be framed by silk flowers. Although mine are going to be stump work. I loved Trisha's dimensional flowers framing her cartouches on her short flat casket. It's really effective. So I'm going to do that, although I'm going to put my sides together in a slightly different way. And then my next, what I would call hero image is a color image. So this is a 17th century schoolgirl casket with kind of an unusual color palette. This is probably the result of fading, but my color trinity here is going to be blue, pink, and green, as opposed to the green casket or Liza Townsend where I used a color trinity of pink, red, and green. Green's always one of the corners of my triangles. So I like to think in color trinities because that's the base of my color scheme and then it's built outwards from there. But I always try and have a really strong, cohesive color base from which to work. I don't know if that's a standard color thing or if that's just me and I'm weird, but I always think about what are my three dominant colors? I call that my color trinity. So here I've got a pink, blue, and green trinity as typified by this casket. So my pinks are pale, my greens are kind of medium, and my blues are a little richer. This is a color summary of where I want to go if this is a design summary. So these two images went right at the front of my sketchbook because this is kind of the distillation of where I'm at. And so if I'm just taking notes, I write in pen. When I'm sketching, I do it in pencil. So I put images in order and then I kind of annotate them as I'm thinking. And then just to show kind of some of the other places my inspiration takes me, here I've got a close up from an 18th century waistcoat. This was French made, it was professionally worked. It's gold work. Largely, there's some silk in there too, and it's got this really interesting mix of textures and techniques. So I think some of my flowers are going to be what I would call mixed technique. I wanna see a lot of gold on this gasket. And then this is actually a close-up of a costume from Game of Thrones, which I didn't watch, but I know of the costumer's work, Michelle Carragher. She does really interesting things because professional embroiderers of all centuries are confronted with the same essential problem, right? You have this super time intensive art, but as a professional, you can't just lavish time. It's not effective. You're not gonna get all your work done. So professional embroiderers across the centuries have wrestled with this problem and they have found different ways to be efficient with their time. And Michelle Carragher does this interesting mix of applique of ready-made materials that are then over embroidered or embellished. And so you get these interesting colors and textures. But as somebody who's an advanced embroiderer myself, I can tell you that that didn't take nearly as long to put together as it might look. So professionals, from two different centuries wrestling with the same problem and the interesting techniques that they come up with to solve it is another theme. And I won't show you the entire sketchbook, quite frankly, that's a little too personal. It's like opening up my head and just putting it on TV. But another thing I was looking at is how do I fill the space between the center cartouche and the flowers? So Trisha's cartouches have these extended sides filled in with flowers. I want to approach that a little differently. 
So I've got just a tiny sketch there at the bottom. You may not even be able to see. It's just really light pencil. And then I was looking at a modern piece of jewelry, how lacy it is, how they've essentially arranged the stones to create this texture and then that beautiful interplay of colors. So going from a lighter texture to a more dense one, how they've mixed colors, that makes me think about how I'm going to move outwards from my cartouche. I don't know if that makes any sense. Quite frankly, some of the things that go on inside my head, I'm not sure I can explain in ways that make sense to anyone at all. And then next idea on the sides is the flanking flowers. So I know those are going to be stump work, but they're not going to be especially literal 17th century stump work, at least not the way it looks at right now. I mean, we're still in the concept phase, so this could look really different by the time it's actually stitched and finished. But this is a 17th century schoolgirl piece. It's close up. And that's a beautifully textured stumpwork flower. It's in a more open stitch. I think that's Venetian point stitch. And then I thought about using those 17th century techniques, but then putting crystals and gold and different types of materials in the center instead of sticking to just silk. And how you could combine those things is typified by an embroidered clutch. This is Oh, years ago from Alexander McQueen and they've taken silk under stitching and then they've put beads and sequins and then hung crystal drops off it. How cool is that? So one of the things I'm really playing with here is the idea of how you mix techniques, mix eras and maybe come up with some unexpected combinations. And then the last thing I'll show you from my inspiration book is what's gonna go in the cartouches. So those are gonna be birds. After the fabulous embroidered birds on the glove gauntlet, that is my kind of defining inspiration image. And then I filled out this phase of my sketchbook with different embroidered birds. So this is from a Whitney Antiques catalog. It's a beautiful mix of silk shading and then some over detailing in metal thread spectacular. I love a good parrot. And then this is a 17th century schoolgirl casket, but I liked it because it showed the different ways you could position birds or animals and then fill them out as part of the composition. And then between that, underneath that, I have my notes on what are my birds going to be because for every casket you have nine panels, no matter what the shape is lid, four friezes, so those are the four sides of the lid, and then the four sides of the bottom of the box. So you have to think about, well, you don't always have to think about. A lot of 17th century schoolgirl caskets are a lot of different ideas thrown together on the same box. I like to have more of a coherent design thread running through my piece to pull it together, so I'm thinking about how do I marry all of these things and turn them into a coherent design? And so trying to collect all of my inspiration, organize it, and then think about the different ways that I'm going to stitch and render it is phase one. So I've collected my inspiration, I've organized it, I've started making notes and then the next pages in my sketchbook will be my, my initial sketches before I get to the point of actually designing panels. Another really important thing in this process is starting to pull materials. So this is just a box of things that I'm thinking about because this is all design work that will lead to a line drawing. The next stage in embroidery is in bringing it to life and choosing what thread, what technique. How do you render your line drawing into a fully dimensional embroidery? And one essential part of that process is 
materials. Now, my, this is really focused on my cartouches and how I'm going to bring those to life because I'm thinking about texture. So I have been collecting and gathering some of my really interesting textured gold work threads. Um, pretty much all of these have been bought from Thistle Threads. This is a whipped plate. Some of these were from recent frostings boxes. I signed up. I purchased the most recent frostings box. I can't wait to see what's in it. I will be showing that when it arrives. So I've got all of these kind of just interesting metal threads in my materials box and as I start drawing I'm going to try to start mentally pairing something on the drawing with a technique and a material. I can't at least myself separate those two processes the design and then how I'm always going to work the design go hand in hand for me so those aren't separate processes they go together so I'm thinking about materials at the same time I'm thinking about line drawing so unfortunately I don't have a lot of time for this project right now there's so much going on. There's so much coming to Katie Stark and Argus and Embroidery in 2024. Holidays coming up really soon. I'm so excited about that. However, I wanted to at least start and show you where I start. I hope that wasn't just a lot of babbling and then some of it actually made sense. I don't really know whether or not I can articulate my process very well because it's so inside my head. But I wanted to at least get started and I hope to start drawing before my next floss tube. If I have something more to show you, if I have some sketches, I will show them and we'll look at this project as I have progress on it, but that won't be every floss tube. However, I did want to at least get started because one thing that we're never guaranteed in life is time. I mean, it's a guarantee for pretty much every stitcher that we won't have enough of it but that we'll have at least a baseline to do some of the big things that we're dreaming about definitely isn't a guarantee. And I love everything that I stitch. That's why I give my time to it. But the thing that I get the most satisfaction out of are the really big projects that are of my own design. Those provide a challenge for me that I love to just sink my teeth into and those mean the most to me although I find different kinds of enjoyment in all the kinds of things that I stitch. So I am going to try and make time for starting this casket although I don't know how far I'm going to get to it because you've got to make time for these things. If there is anything that you dream of, that you wish to do, and you're putting off for the day when you have more time, or you have more experience, or you have more expertise, or you have more materials, seriously, don't. At least make a start. Put in a stitch, draw a sketch, because the day when you have all that time and experience and expertise may never come. You've got to make time as far as possible for the things that you want to do, even though if that's only a tiny amount of time and a couple of stitches and a really big project, whether that's a sampler or a casket or Queen Anne's pin pillow or anything else. It's just, I've heard too many people say that, you know, they're waiting for something and the time's never going to be right, really, from my own experience. You have to just dive in. Sorry about the lecture. I feel very passionately about that. So that's why I'm trying to scrape some time out of an over busy schedule for something that I have dreamed of for a long time and that I really do want to get started on. So I'm going to try and find some time to do some sketching and start pulling together some designs. I've really only thought about the sides so far. I do have some thoughts about the top, but they're much less developed. So I'm going to start with the sides because that's where I know where I'm going and that's where I can get started. So I'm going to do that and then I'll deal with the top of this casket when it comes time for that. A lot of talking. 
sorry, I really hope that was coherent and not incredibly and excruciatingly boring. So let's get to give away what our you guys really earned it if you sat through all of that truly. So the Vertimart notebook was never claimed, so I drew a new winner for that, and that is Liz Handel. I'm a Gator Vet Mom. So I have commented on your comment. Please give me your mailing address and I will get this sent out to you. Someone claim poor Britta Mark, come on, she's just languishing. And then the winner of the linen sample, which was last episode's giveaway, is Corrine Burnham, B-U-R-H-A-M. Commented on your comment, please send me your mailing address and I will get you your fabulous linen sampler. Thank you all for watching and supporting my floss tubes and listening to my weird rambling about my design thoughts. That was probably awful. I hope it wasn't awful. <laughs> Anyways, for next time we'll have more of a regular floss tube and at least the rambling was at the end, so hopefully you could turn that off if it was boring. But for next time, we're gonna have fall stitching. Uh, progress on Thomas, I hope I'm gonna get my start on my little Stacy Nash. I'll be sharing the conversion for that and for my mom's Hello Fall. She might be on herself if she's back from her travels. There will also be progress on AKGIT. Can I make it to the 50% mark? We'll see, I'm gonna be close whether or not I'm actually there. And then I will also be previewing the holiday kit releases. Now, those are gonna be in November. I think it is wrong not to give fall its due. So nothing is getting released before Halloween. I have a bright line on that. However, they're gonna be in November. And so for the next floss tube, which will be the first, the last floss tube before the release, we'll be previewing the holiday kit releases for this year. I've been working on this for a while and I'm really excited to finally share that with you. No, there's not an angel. There was only Theodora. Those were absolutely insane to put together. So that was a one-time thing. There are still Theodoras if you would like to get on that train. I think some people have. I shipped several out last week. So that's what's on deck for next time. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I'll see you again in two weeks. And until then, happy stitching.